Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. Today, I'd like to revisit our cart problem. So we're going to we're going to take a look at our cart, and it's going to be traveling with the same velocity uh, as previously, some velocity v naught to the right. And like we did previously, we're going to attach some sort of spring to the front of it. We'll make that spring red. Uh, we're going to attach some sort of spring to the front of it, so it's traveling with our velocity v naught, like I said. And what we've done previously is we've had it hit a wall and um, it's bounced back or we've had it hit a wall and it's stuck and we've looked at how it vibrates. But today we're going to have it hit something different. At time equals zero, that cart is going to hit another cart exactly like it that's standing still. And the spring is going to stick to cart two. And I want to know what happens. What happens over time? What happens between the carts? What happens with the spring? And most importantly, how do we model this mathematically? Today, we're going to set up the equations of motion for this model, reduce to quadrature, and try to understand what we have here. Then, at the end, we'll take a look at what a numerical solution would give us, just to get it, give us an idea of what the final motion might look like. Now that said, let's start it off with our free body diagrams. First, let's draw a free body diagram of uh, number one, ma uh, mass number one. It's going to be right here. We're going to have our force of gravity. We're going to have the normal force. These both in the vertical directions. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, here's our Here's our coordinates. And um, we're going to always assume that the tension, or that the spring, is always in tension. And if we're wrong, it's going to be in compression. We'll get a negative. So let's also then do free body two. And you know enough now that this is probably pretty obvious. We're going to have, since, it, since the spring is in tension, we have the force of the spring right there our normal force right there, and our gravity right here. Now, to be clear, the reason we're choosing to have the spring always in tension is because it gives us a standard practice that we can change or revise later on if we need to. Finally, let's draw the free body diagram of the spring. And this one will be pretty simple. We'll go here, here's our spring, and we have the force and an equal and opposite force. Now if we want to understand what's happening, we'll need to write our equations of motion. Uh, before we get in on that, I'm looking at the force of the spring. I know that the force of the spring has something to do with the distance between the two objects, but I haven't written it down for you yet. So let's go ahead and write that down. We know that the spring has some constant um, that influences how, how much force it takes to compress it um, stretch it and we're going to say that it has some rest length of L. For the sake of argument we're going to say that as soon as the carts touch the spring is completely relaxed. Now that said I'm going to define this length here as L and that way that way I'm going to kind of incorporate the length of the cart in with this and we don't have to worry about it. Next I want to define what the positions are. This is x1 off the left side of the first cart, and this is x2 off the left side of the right cart. Now here comes the tricky part. How do we define the change in length of the spring? Well, we know that originally, if we take x2 minus x1, that's going to give us this distance. And we know that if we then subtract L, we're going to subtract L, that's going to get us the deviation from what it should be. Because it's supposed to be L. Like right off the bat, x2 minus x1, the spring, that's its unstretched state. So the change should be zero. This whole thing should be zero right here when it's not stretched. So x2 and x1 are going to change, L won't, so that should be all delta L, which means that if we wanted to, we do our force of our spring 
equals k times x2 minus x1 minus l. What I'd like to do now is, um, is try it out. Let's say x2 increases a whole bunch. x1 stays the same. x2 is going to increase a whole bunch. All right, so you're going to have the spring in tension. That means fs here is going to be positive. Is that what happens here? Well, sure, x2 is now bigger. So this number, all, this whole number is going to go to positive, and that means that this force is going to be pulling back on free body diagram 2 or on, block, on mass 2. So this is our equation for the force of the spring. Now let's use our equations of motion. We know that the sum of the forces equals mass times v dot. And at this point, you might start wondering, well, which v dot? Great question. The answer is yes. We're going to do it for both of them. So the sum of the forces for number one, for mass one in the x direction, is going to be k x2 minus x1 minus l. Whoops, sorry about those parentheses right there. Equals, and we're going to say that they have the same mass, just for sake of argument, mv1 dot. So there. We have an equation of motion. Everything looks great except for one thing. We have an x2 and an equation of motion for 1. Next thing for, for x1. The next thing we're going to do is we'll do the sum of the forces equals mv dot for free body diagram 2. So that's going to be k pretty much. Um, now this force is in the negative direction. So we're going to have a negative k x2 minus x1 minus L equals mv2 dot. Now at this point we've gone, we've reduced this to quadrature. This is as far as we can go. We have two equations but we do not have any good methods for evaluating these. The one further step that we do need to do is let's also evaluate or identify our initial conditions. So we know that at x1 at time 0 equals 0. We know that the velocity of 1, x1 dot, at time equals 0 is v naught. We know that the distance, the position of x2 at 0 is L. Everything's unstretched. And finally, we know that the velocity of 2 at 0 equals 0. At this point, we can't go any further. We don't know what the solutions are. The only way to do it is to do it numerically. I hope this gives you a little bit of a feel of how to set up these types of multi-body collisions. I'm sure, as you can see, that this is, can be a, an incredibly complex and rich area of study, and we're only going to scratch the surface of it here. Join me in our next video when we look at this problem's numerical setup and the solution. I look forward to seeing you then.